Freedom is one of America's defining traits. Protecting that freedom for all of us is the First Amendment. The 45 words of the First Amendment guarantee five freedoms, religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. This is a story of how we got the First Amendment and how quickly the government turned against it. It's also the story of an important early battle between politicians and the press. While the words of our historic characters are direct quotes from writings of their day, in our modern times, we may find their issues and their passion uncomfortably familiar. April 1789, George Washington arrives in New York City for his first inauguration. Newspaper editors reflect the country's optimism. It's impossible to do justice describing the scene of His Excellency's approach to the city. All ranks and professions express their feelings with rapture, hailing the arrival of the father of our nation. Washington had prestige beyond anyone else in the country. He was respected, uh, respected more possibly than any other American leader has ever been since. Washington takes office with overwhelming public support. But within a few short years, George Washington, hero of the revolution, faces fierce and growing opposition. To King George Washington, Retire immediately. You are utterly incapable of steering the political ship into the harbor of safety. Benjamin Franklin Beche, a grandson of Benjamin Franklin, publishes the Aurora, an important Philadelphia newspaper. The political press in this period gets very ugly. We think our modern press is nasty, mean-spirited, and intemperate. Any politician today thrown back into the 1790s would be screaming for his mother in a New York minute. Because these guys were not fooling around. They would say things that you just couldn't imagine. The country splits into two political parties with opposite views on the future of the nation. Each side has its own partisan newspapers. Federalists, led by President Washington, favor the growing power and authority of a strong central government. Opposition Democratic Republicans call for the protection of personal liberty against the power of government. Ten years ago, I fought the British because they wanted to tax us, take away our liberties, and run this country from their capital city across the water. It seems to me that this is exactly what this new constitution is setting up in this little club called Congress. If we make the constitution better in the opinion of those who are opposed to it, without weakening its structure or limiting its usefulness, we're doing a wise thing. James Madison composes the Bill of Rights and convinces Congress to adopt it. Its guarantee of citizens' rights addresses the fears of those concerned about the power of government. The Bill of Rights includes the First Amendment, which, with 45 words, forbids government interference with certain fundamental freedoms. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The press is protected because citizens need accurate information to govern themselves. If it were left up to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I shouldn't hesitate for a moment to choose newspapers. Jefferson may be thinking about Benny Bache's Aurora, called the Bible of Democracy by its supporters. 
The Aurora's attacks on Federalists are reprinted in sympathetic newspapers all around the country. If ever a nation was ravished by a man, the American nation has been ravished by Washington. If ever a nation was deceived by a man, the American nation has been deceived by Washington. Our wisest and best leaders driven from office by the unceasing and malignant slander of newspapers. Federalists blame newspaper attacks for President Washington's decision to retire from office. Civility just did not seem to have a place in the press. Too much at stake. In, in addition, the press was as vile as it was back in those days because there was no tradition of fairness. Overseas events aggravate the political conflict. France, already at war with England, seizes some American ships at sea. Federalists believe war between the United States and France is likely. This whole period is an era of crisis. And the crises divide the population. And the question is, can we fight these things out and still remain united? We're used to the idea. They're not. They're scared. And we must never forget how scared they were. It's very simple. Any American who's a friend of the present government is a true patriot because the administration is elected by a majority of the people. Any American who's against the administration is an anarchist and a traitor. It is patriotic to support the government, sedition to write against it. Benny Bache continues to criticize the Federalist, shifting his aim from Washington to his successor in office, John Adams. Old, querulous, bald, blind, crippled, toothless Adams. Scarcely a day passes without some scurrility in Bache's paper. He has the true malice of Satan not only collecting foul abuse from the French fanatics, but he adds to these lies, calumny and bitterness of his own. If that fellow and his agents at other newspapers are not suppressed, it will result in civil war. To answer Beige, the Federalists call on William Cobbett. A powerful and outrageous political writer, he attacks enemies under the pen name Peter Porcupine. Ah, uh, yes. Benny Beige, grandson of that whoremaster infidel Benjamin Franklin. Men of understanding know him as a liar, a tool. A hireling faithful to the blood-soaked rebels of France as a dog ever is to his master. Let's deal with him as we would a mad dog. There is now proposed in Congress a sedition bill. Its clear object, the suppression of our presses. Beche, in particular, has been named. Federalists use the threat of war with France as an excuse to crush political enemies. Only seven years after the First Amendment takes effect, Congress makes a law to silence government critics. Under the Sedition Act, it is illegal to write, utter, publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writings against the government or the president or either house of Congress with the intent to defame or bring them into disrepute or excite against them the hatred of the good people of the United States. Even before the bill is passed, Beish is arrested. He is required to post a bail of $4,000, an amount that nearly bankrupts his family. Under the threat of war and in the name of national security, civil liberties guaranteed by the Bill of Rights are disappearing.
Think about it. Everything's at stake as they see it. The legacy of the revolution, its meaning for posterity. They're fighting this battle for themselves, but in some odd ways, they're fighting it for us as well. And it's a no-holds-barred war. History has shown that those who try and throw chains around human intellect have no other motive than to keep their fellow human beings more completely under their control. Laws must only regulate our actions. Leave our opinions alone. Newspaper man Matthew Lyon is the focus of a clash between opinion and government power. Lyon, who came to America as a servant from Ireland, is now a congressman from Vermont. He wins office through the use of a new weapon, his own populist newspaper. Indeed, I'm not like you, an American of better blood. I am not like you, descended from the bastards of Oliver Cromwell, or you from those Puritans who punished their horses for breaking the Sabbath, or you, a true American who delighted in burning witches. Representative Roger Griswold of Connecticut resents Lyon's presence in Congress. During a confrontation on the floor of Congress, Griswold accuses Lyon of cowardice. He sets his hand on Lyon's arm and repeats the insult. Lyon answers him by... by spitting in his face. Well, maybe I didn't use the right method with him. We don't always have the power of judging exactly the right thing to do when we're rudely insulted. On the other hand, if I had borne it patiently, I'd have been bandied about in all the newspapers as a low-down coward. A few weeks later, again on the floor of Congress, Griswold retaliates with a walking stick. I call him a scoundrel and give him my first blow. He tries to get away, but I get off 20 good blows on the head before he gets to the fireplace to grab a pair of tongs. After the fight, Lyon returns to Vermont to campaign for re-election. He changes the name of his newspaper to The Scourge of Aristocracy. When every throne-loving aristocratic hireling is vomiting forth columns of lies and deception, the scourge will oppose Republican truth to falsehood. These days, everyone who's not in favor of this mad war with France is called disloyal or an anarchist. This new kind of jargon is designed to confuse people. Five days after Lyon publishes those words, he is indicted for sedition. He is convicted, fined, and sentenced to four months in prison. Campaigning from his cell, Lyon is re-elected with a huge majority. When released, he travels from Vermont to Congress in Philadelphia. At every town along the way, crowds greet him like a national hero. A toast to Colonel Matthew Lyon, a martyr to the cause of liberty and the rights of man. May something good come from this evil. Let his sufferings arouse the people to guard their rights. In what has been called the Revolution of 1800, Democratic Republican Thomas Jefferson wins the presidency. The Federalist Party is mortally wounded and begins its disappearance from American politics. Popular revulsion against the Sedition Act is certainly a factor in that outcome. It was an ugly time in our history. It seemed we'd lost sight of the importance of freedom of the press. But you know what? Adams may have done us a favor because he established very early on in this country why we needed a First Amendment. So one ugly couple of years in American history may have paved the way for the next 200 years of respect for these fundamental principles.
Over the years, Americans have used their First Amendment freedoms to challenge the government to live up to its ideals. Abolitionists used them to call for an end to slavery. Women used them to gain the right to vote. And civil rights activists used them to fight legalized segregation and racism. During the past 200 years, the First Amendment has been attacked, debated, and defended. But through it all, the ability of ordinary citizens to express themselves freely survives as a critical element of American democracy.